Well, friends, how fantastic is that to be introduced by a young progressive and a young progressive woman? It's really just so inspiring. And I'd like to ask you all to thank, uh, well, I guess to acknowledge all of the graduates from the Young Pro Progressive Leaders Group. And we should also thank Amy Moratori for her terrific opening. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Uncle Charles Madden for his generous welcome to country. I also acknowledge the Gadigal people and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Well, friends, welcome to the second Progressive Australia Conference. It's an absolutely fantastic program this weekend and I'm really pleased to tell you that it draws on the broadest possible traditions in our movement. Feels good to be here with many old friends, but I suspect also many new ones. And I know that we're joined online by many of our friends and supporters. And I'm hoping that whether you're here with us physically or whether you're out there virtually, you'll be involved in the Twitter conversation. And the hashtag is hashtag Progressive Oz, and that's Oz with an O-Z. So we meet at a time of loss. And there's no sugarcoating the disappointment that comes with defeat. It's all the more surprising then that we also meet at a time of great hope. The ballot for Labor's leader was an unequivocal success. So many of us here for so many years have argued that handing power to the people would strengthen us. Well, I think that argument has been well and truly settled. Four and a half thousand new members have joined our ranks. More than 70% of our members chose to participate in a historic process that set the pace not just for Labor, but for all Australian political parties. But the question we now confront, of course, is where to next? Now, I've assembled my thoughts about this, and with your indulgence, I'll share them with you today. But I want to first take just a moment to reflect on the significance of today's gathering. It's only a few years ago, in 2011, that we were here together, reeling from the shock of an election which left us barely clinging to government. We'd been outspent four to one by our opponents and they drew on a deep well of funds from those keen to oppose us on climate and to oppose us on the mining tax. But at that most unhappy time, something very important happened here at the very first Progressive Australia conference. We all came together, 400 people, at that dark moment, and we found hope. We found hope in the stories that were coming from the US and the UK about the power of community. We named the failures of our old model, an arms race for corporate donations and a dependence on narrow technocratic campaign methods at the expense of authenticity. We saw the opportunities presented by social media by the crumbling of the old media's hegemony and by the power of conversations and stories between ordinary people. And like political activists all around the world, inspired by the Obama story, we imagined our movement built to twice its strength. We found that we could envisage a Labor Party that was built on members rather than on money. The last conference was the moment when progressives in our movement crystallised our support for community organising. And by the 2013 campaign, the landscape looked very, very different. 1,200,000 telephone calls made by volunteers to voters. 250,000 homes door knocked. Fundraising from small donors, now eclipsing any single contribution from any other source. Just yesterday, at the National Executive, we confirmed that Labor's national membership now for the first time in many, many years, exceeds 50,000 members. It is good, isn't it? And so we look back and we remember that actually it was here in 2011 that we'd rediscovered our movement roots and it has made a very big difference. And in the same way, this conference can make an impact. I want to set out some broad areas where I believe that a concentrated effort this weekend has the chance to shape the next consensus, the next thing we need to do for our future. So we meet in different circumstances this time. At this election, we didn't just scrape through. We lost. 
And not only did we lose, we lost badly. We certainly didn't lose as badly as we might have. But the fact remains that our primary vote was in the low 30s and it is a defeat akin to 1996. Undoubtedly, we were punished for our disunity in government and I've heard no serious commentator dispute this. Now, our Conservative opponents naturally go further and they assert that the election was a rejection of all that Labor stands for. Now, they would say that, uh, and I am not particularly interested in taking lessons from Tony Abbott or commentators in the major dailies about our political philosophy. My strong sense is that the core values which define Labor's agenda remain at the heart of Australian values. It's no coincidence that the Coalition chose to not contest our plan for school funding, to not contest our plan for workplace relations, to not contest our plan for disability care. It is no coincidence that for all of their triumphalism, the Liberal primary vote rose by less than 2%. And it confirms the analysis made by that excellent writer, uh, the American Sherry Burma, Berman, who says that the ideology that triumphed in the 20th century was not liberalism. It was actually social democracy. The ethic of shared responsibility for our community's wellbeing is at the heart of both modern labour and modern Australia. And if we failed, it was not, as some have suggested, by being too left-wing, and it was not, as some have suggested, a failure of communication. It was a failure of confidence. If our communication was confused, it was because we could not consistently back our own values. We were unwilling to lay out clearly the philosophical underpinnings of equality and justice that informed so many of our policies. And as a movement, we were unprepared for the inevitable conflict which comes when you take on significant vested interests. So as we seek to build uh, for government again, I don't believe that we should back away from the causes that define our movement. Uh, to name just one current example, we should certainly hold our ground on climate change and carbon pricing. It's a moral cause. It's a moral cause and it defines our generation. We must be clear about our purpose amongst ourselves and with our public. Without that clarity, we can't hope to steer a steady course through the shallow trivia of daily politics. And I think that that means starting with our values. Uh, the path forward doesn't lie in policy detail. There is plenty of that. Oh, is it not loud? I'm so sorry. Is that better? Sorry, peeps. Uh, the path forward lies not in policy detail, but in a much broader conversation about our political philosophy. And as the co-chair of the National Policy Forum, I found it was one of the persistent themes from all delegates when we held our first meeting earlier this year. For me personally, the most important starting point for Labor's rebuilding is a much clearer statement of our commitment to tackle inequality not inequality of opportunity, but inequality itself. And on this note, I should say that I am particularly looking forward to this afternoon's keynote with the remarkable Patrick Diamond. Now, I recognise that there will be others who disagree with this personal priority, possibly vehemently disagree. And I want to say a couple of words about the importance of building a healthy culture of conflict. I know it sounds a little odd, but as Hegel taught us, uh, conflict is essential to progress. There will always be conflict in our broad church. There should always be conflict in our broad church. If the leadership ballot has taught us anything, it should be that we, we are mature enough to disagree civilly. And when we can, it will strengthen us. As we seek to reshape Labor's philosophy for modern times, this is a strong place to build from. 
Now, I realise that quoting Tony Blair in such a crowd as this risks a very mixed response, but I really love this quote. And he says, let us have the confidence once again that we can debate new ideas, new thinking, without forever fearing the taunt of betrayal. Let us say what we mean and mean what we say. Well, this agenda this weekend deliberately sets out to cultivate debate and disagreement, to draw in new ideas and span across multiple traditions. It seeks to model the culture that we'll need as we reimagine our story for the 21st century. Now, Labor's Australian story blends libertarianism, laborism, socialism, communitarianism, Fabianism, environmentalism, nonviolence, and feminism into our own blend of social democracy. And this weekend, our agenda tries to tease out some of these themes. We'll hear from two of our leading parliamentary women, Tanya Plibersek and Penny Wong, on Labor's future. Tomorrow, we'll see excellent panels on the significance of the state for progressives, on questions of liberty and policy making around public health. And today we'll see workshops on the role of faith in progressive politics and on environmentalism, workshops that seek to explore the broadest of our traditions. I've focused so far uh, in my remarks on the importance of political clarity. What one of our politicians turned authors, Lindsay Tanner, recently described as politics with purpose. We also need to acknowledge that Labor's task is always harder. We need to understand how bitterly our agenda will be resisted. There are things here that we can learn from the Conservatives, who for 30 years have been absolutely clear about the kind of society that they are trying to create. They have built the institutions necessary to really effectively prosecute their agenda. If we think about the Conservative arsenal, it includes prominent columnists and radio commentators, think tanks like the IPA and the Sydney Institute, online communities like that around Menzies House, and increasingly a Tea Party style grassroots right wing movement like the Convoy of No Consequence, uh, which descended on Anthony Albanese's office when he dared to challenge their flat earth view of the world. And those conservative forces constantly push the boundaries of debate. You think about that IPA 50-point plan for Australia, which sets out all the radical interventions that the Liberals themselves don't dare to name. As progressives, we have our own significant resources. Uh, but too often, we lack coordination between ourselves. And too often, we emphasise rather than minimise our differences. A mature movement can surely appreciate that will use diverse tactics in pursuit of a common goal. A mature Labor Party can surely appreciate that critique from progressives can assist us by opening up the political landscape, giving us greater freedom to act on our beliefs. And tomorrow's panel on building the intellectual architecture for the left presents one opportunity to think seriously about the resources that we will need if we are to win. And that's not just winning government it is winning the battle of ideas. It brings me finally to the question of organisation in the Labor Party. Now, as we've seen in the last months, the extension of real power to members is extraordinarily energising. There is nothing more important to our members than having a real say, and there is nothing more conducive to growth. And growth is essential if we are to build a movement that is capable of mounting a progressive argument and winning. This is the beginning, not the end, of democratisation. It is time for a conversation around candidate selection, around the election of our delegates to state and national conferences, and around the selection of the committees which govern our national and state organisations between conferences. Democracy itself is necessary, but not sufficient. Our efforts are not simply directed at building a perfectly democratic organisation. Our goal is to build a powerful organisation, capable of taking our arguments to the Australian people. And we need to imagine a meaningful campaigning role for the many new members who will join us and for the union members in our affiliates. To build a powerful member-based organisation, we'll need democracy. 
But we'll also need training and resources. We'll need to place our trust in the local women and men who will lead our local campaigns, allowing them to set their own agenda, confident in their ability to read and understand their local community. The agenda is scattered with excellent panels and speakers on community organising and campaigning. And it's also scattered with speakers on organisational reform, including tomorrow's panel af uh, tomorrow afternoon around reimagining labour. I started by reflecting on the Progressive Australia Conference in 2011. I think that we can all be very proud of the political impact of that conference. And my challenge to this conference, to all of us, is for us to bring together a vision for a powerful values-based agenda, a vision for an architecture, architecture to prosecute that agenda, and bring it together with the vision for the party's organisation and campaigning. And on that note, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce...